Welcome to my webinar. Thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, one thing that I like to do a lot is laugh, so I say this phrase very frequently. Where, where are my subtitles? I thought we had subtitles. Uh, oh, well. Anyway, I was hoping that this would be on the subtitles. Uh, so we say this in the United States a lot, LOL, and so I've been studying Catalan because I'm here in Spain, and I understand that apparently in Spanish it's LOL. Uh, <laughs> As you can tell, I've been studying very hard. <laughs> Hi. My name is Aaron Patterson. Uh, you might know me on the internet as Tenderlove. Uh, I work for a company called Red Hat. That is where I work. Uh, I'm on the Manage IQ team, and we uh, build software to manage clouds. So if you have a cloud, we can manage clouds. And our software is open source, so you should go there and check it out. It's on GitHub. So you can go see it if you want to. Um, I own two cats, and I need to show them off. This one is, this is SeaTac Airport Facebook YouTube. Uh, she's named after uh, the airport and Facebook and YouTube. That is, that is what she's named after. Uh, this is another picture of her. She likes to sit on my desk while I'm working. This is my other more, my other more famous cat. He's, uh, this one is uh, Gorbachev Puff Puff Thunder Horse. That's my my second cat, and actually I have stickers of him with me, so if you would like a sticker of my cat, then come say hello to me afterwards and I will give you one. Just say, Aaron, I would like a sticker and I will give it to you. So uh, I'm on the Ruby core team, the Rails core team, and the Rack core team, and that last one is important for this talk. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, and I'm, I'm really happy to be here at Baruco. So thank you for having me. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm also happy that this is part of the Full Stack Fest, although I have to admit, I'm not sure why you're allowing me to speak here because I'm actually just a short stack developer. Uh, yes, you knew there were going to be pancake jokes at this, at the, <laughs> at this conference, right? Um, anyway, I have, I have one product announcement that I want to make here before we, before we really get into the meat of this talk. Uh, we heard earlier Brian was talking about 12-factor apps, and well, actually, I want to announce that uh, today we're releasing 13-factor apps. <laughs> it's one E0 factor <laughs> better. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I know like a lot of you are developers, you're probably app developers, I want to talk to you about apps. I really want to talk to you about apps. Uh, and especially like a lot, I know a lot of you, you, we're all developers here and you're probably developing multiple apps, right? You, maybe not right now, but in the past you've developed one or more applications. And in the US we like to refer to this as N, N applications, but typically we shorten that to uh, naps, <laughs> or as you call that here in Spain, a siesta. <laughs> I told you, I've been working on my Spanish. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, please fill out the speaker cards. We're <laughs> vote me number one. We're going to go take a nap now. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can end it now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make a joke about apps and tapas, but I couldn't, I couldn't quite figure that one out. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, I should tell. So last night, oh man. So last night we go out. <laughs> This is, this is off script. I'm going off script here for a minute. We went out for, went out for dinner last night, and we're leaving, and, and Brian says, ah, oh, it's rained. It's definitely rained. And I was like, no, that's impossible. It could not have rained. And he's like, why? Why do you say that? And I'm like, well, we're in the city. And he's like, what do you mean? And I said, well, it's because the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plane. <laughs> and I almost hurt myself laughing. <laughs> So basically, that's what it's going to be up here, is me 30 minutes making stupid jokes and laughing at myself. So really, this talk is for me. 
<laughs> anyway, okay, okay, okay. Let's, let's talk about some tech stuff. Um, so I, I want to talk about uh, the request and response uh, system, the way that that works in Rails, and I want to talk about basically the future of that. We're going to talk about HTTP2, which I will from now refer to as H2 because HTTP2 is way too long to say, and I don't want to say that over and over again. We're going to talk about Rack, and then we'll look at the Rails request and response pipeline, how a request and a response goes through the system. And then at the end here, we'll talk about the future Rails, Rack, and uh, H2. So the first thing I want to look at, we're going to look at H2, but I want to look at it from uh, an app developer's perspective. So I mean, we, we work on applications, and I don't really care about the protocol necessarily. I care about you know, what, can I, what can I build with this, or what can I do with this. That's what I really want to talk about this. Uh, is from an app developer's perspective. So first, we'll take a look at the benefits. Some of the benefits are that it's, it's a binary protocol, which means it's more compact over the wire. It's easier to parse. There's only one parse path through the, through the parser. Uh, only one code path you have to go through in order to parse a response. Uh, but that's not always a good thing. It means that we can't just look at the data over the wire and understand exactly what's going on. It's binary. You can't just look at it and say, oh, that's what's, that's what's happening. So that's, that's one downside. Um, another upside is that it's, it's multiplexed. And what that means is that we, have, we can have multiple requests and responses going over one socket. So today, we'd have m maybe multiple sockets for multiple requests. Like if you want to do requests in parallel, you have to open multiple sockets to do that. Uh, so for example, like this, would be, this would be an example of the network Today, we have one client making many requests to the server like for assets or whatever. And maybe, you know, of course, there's keep lives and whatnot, but we'll ignore that for now. There's probably many open connections. With H2, it'll look something like this. We'll just have one connection, and you'll do all of your requests and responses over that one particular connection. Uh, another advantage is that it has header compression, so all those headers all the HTTP headers get compressed before they're sent over the wire, and that actually saves a lot, saves a lot of data. Uh, and another thing that's a good benefit is it uses SSL, but doesn't have to. Actually, when the, when the H2 spec was approved, SSL, the SSL requirement was dropped from it, so you don't have to do H2 over SSL, but browsers today, like I said, we're going to talk about it from an app developer perspective. Bro the only browsers today that implement H2 uh, Chrome and Firefox. I think Safari does, but only on uh, only on the new betas of OS X. Uh, Chrome and Firefox only do H2 over SSL. So you don't have to, but it does. Another nice advantage is you can do server pushes. So you can say, like, OK, uh, I know that the client is going to need this particular asset, so I'm going to push it down to the client in advance. Like, let's say you're building some sort of I don't know, an Ember app or something that typically what you would do is embed that first JSON payload in the HTML and send it down. Now you don't have to do that anymore. You can just send the JSON payload down with a server push. Uh, now, one thing I want to talk about is how to tell whether or not you're using H2. This was a, this was a um, problem for me is how do I know that I'm actually using it? When you look at the browser, you can't necessarily tell. In Chrome, what you do is you go to the special URL here. If you go to this URL, you can see the connections that you have open. And this is what it'll kind of look like. You'll see this. I have an H2 connection open to localhost there. You can see it's open to localhost port 3000, uh, and the protocol is H2. So you'll, you'll see right there. Uh, now, what's cool is uh, there's a bunch of other stuff there, too, that's like, whatever. I don't know, some stuff. Anyway, what's neat is that in this demo, you'll see up here I have multiple tabs open to the same, I have like five tabs open to localhost, but uh, yes, my nice little transition there. Look at those beautiful tabs. All of those tabs are open, but in the previous slide we saw the connection settings. There's only one connection open. So like I said, I said earlier that it shares, you know, you do all of your requests and responses over one connection, and that even goes to multiple tabs on your browser. So despite the fact that I have five tabs open, it'll, it's only maintaining one connection back to the server, which I think is interesting. Uh, another thing you can see is if you click protocol here, you can add protocol in the uh, debugger, and it'll show you the protocol for each of the requests. So you'll see when I add that, you get a protocol column, and all of those indicate H2. 
Another way to tell that you're doing H2 is you'll see all of the, all of the headers are actually lowercase. So they've standardized on lowercase headers, which is like, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very happy about that. Uh, and then we have down here these special headers. You'll see uh, the, there are special headers that start with a colon, and those indicate the different, different parts of the request, like the path and the verb. Those things that would be in the first line, those are actually broken down into special headers, and those ones start with a colon. So you can tell that you're using H2 from there as well. Now, if we look at Firefox, Firefox, I have to admit, is not nearly as user-friendly with this, with regards to this, as Chrome is. If we look in Firefox, you can see, like, basically the only way I could tell that I'm using H2 in Firefox is right there. That, it says, X Firefox Speedy H2. And what was really, really annoying about this is, as I'm doing development work, I'm, I'm not sending that header. That's just inserted by Firefox. Firefox just inserted that and was like, hey, here you go. Here's this header that you didn't send. <laughs> like, how did that header get there? I don't know. I just added it. There you go. <laughs> anyway, so, all right. We know how to tell whether or not we're using H2. We can see from the browser. We see what the connections look like. Let's, now let's start talking about Rack and then move into Rails and then how we'll get H2 with Rails. So here's, we're going to talk about Rack. This is what the API looks like today. We have, uh, this is a very simple Rack, Rack application. What happens is Rack calls your object with call and it passes an environment and that environment is a hash and then you return an array and that array contains all of your response information like the status code, the headers, and then the body. That's, this is the entire, the entire API. And this works. This API works. And I also think this API is successful. And I was thinking about this. And I think the reason that this API is successful is because it's easy. It's very easy. You can look at that code and you see, hey, that's, that's our whole application there in like a few lines of code. No problem. The API is very easy. And one problem that Rack solves, I mean, the, the API is easy, but I don't think that's the main reason that Rack is successful. I think the main reason that Rack is successful is because it helps us avoid a, an explosion of dependencies. And it does this through the adapter pattern. And what I mean is, like, right here we have a bunch of adapters. All of these web servers speak the Rack protocol. And then all of the application servers, like Rails or, or Sinatra, also speak the Rack protocol. And then we just converge on that one place in the middle. Now, imagine a world that we didn't have Rack. If, if this, such a world existed, rather than having this one gem in the middle there, we would have to have, like, you know, Unicorn Rails, Passenger Rails, Puma Rails, Webrick Rails, every single combination of web server plus framework. Rack solves this issue, so we don't have to have this explosion of, uh, explosion of dependencies. So one thing, the next thing I want to do a little bit here is I, I know that there is, I mean, a, a dark side to this conference. And this dark side is coming in a couple days, and I believe that is the JavaScript <laughs> side. <laughs> so we're going to get a little, a tiny little preview of that. So this is what I want to compare Node.js with Rack. This is a, the top one there is a very simple Node.js application, and then the very bottom one is a Rack application, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but I just want to show this to you to kind of get your minds like rolling a little bit. You can see the differences here is that uh, in Node, you get a request and a response object, and you don't return the response. That does not happen. You actually write the response out to a response object, where with Rack, we get an end, and we actually have to return the response. OK, so just think about that a little bit as we journey through the rest of this talk. Uh, so let's talk about. Rack middleware. Yes, rack middleware. One of my favorite things in the entire world. And if you follow me on Twitter, I'm sure that you'll notice how much I love rack middleware. Rack middleware is all those effing frames in the call stack when I do puts caller. I'm in, I, I do a lot of work with Rails, the framework itself, and I'm looking at all the stuff in the, frame, in the stack itself. So typically, I'll be in the controller doing puts call and look at all the stuff that's in there. So all of those things in the stack are pretty much uh, rack middleware. So OK, there's rack middleware in there. How does, how does rack middleware work? All right, here's how rack middleware works. Today we have the rack API, which we've looked at. Rack middleware look, looks something like this. 
basically it's a linked list. We have a middleware which points at another middleware which points at another middleware and it just calls down that chain of middlewares until it finally middleware, I'm not sure how to pluralize that, middle something, <laughs> all the way down until something returns or a, returns a response body. And this is what it looks like. We say, okay, the next application, we hold a reference to that, we call the next application, and then maybe we do something with a response, like for example, we add a header, something like that, and then we return that back up the call stack. So, what I want to do is, uh, what I want to do is, we're gonna do something a little bit interesting. We're gonna look at all of the middleware in the Rails stack, and I know this is gonna be super exciting because all of you have just eaten lunch, and you're just thinking to yourself, wow, I'm in a room, it's kind of warm, had that great lunch, I'd just love to hear about all of the rack middleware and what it does. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. We have an application here that, we have an application with one resource, resources post, okay? That's it, posts. We just process posts, done. One simple Rails application with that. Now somebody comes along and we're gonna, we're gonna imagine what happens is, we have a request, the request comes in and the request is for get users, okay? This is the request that comes in. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna find out what happens to the request all the way down the Rails stack and then back up, okay? And we're gonna look at every single middleware all the way down. Now, <laughs> I have to deal with this on a daily basis, so <laughs> I'm going to make you deal with it today. Uh, well, so the first thing that happens is, of course, the web server parses, parses the request, and then sends it off to the next thing, and sends that, that request off to our rack middleware. And the very first thing that it hits, the very, very first thing is Rails application, an instance of Rails application. This is the very first thing that it hits. And if you look in that stack, uh, you won't ever see Rails application. Your application, your Rails application, actually inherits from this, uh, inherits from Rails application. So you won't see this, you'll see your, your app, right? So your app. And this is the very first thing that it hits, the very, very first thing that it hits. Okay, so it hits your application, uh, and this is the stuff that it does, builds a request object, and you can see that there is the end hash going on there, and I included both of these because it calls super, so the, the top one is lower in the stack, and that bottom one is the super call, unintuitively. Uh, okay, so this is exciting, right? This hit our application. The, the request hit our application. We should be done now, right? We're done. We're done. We did it. All of the middle, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, so here's the next one, and you know what? Okay, this one's rack send files, so this is in charge of sending files. The description is something like, this is a send file, this middleware, something, something, and you know what? I only have 30 minutes, so we're just gonna do this. There's all these. I don't know, I mean, there's many, many, <laughs> <laughs> Many, am I, am I, <laughs> we're not done yet. <laughs> okay, okay, no, still not done. Uh, okay, still, okay, still, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, now we're done. Okay, no, we're not. We're not done yet. I'm sorry. So after all of those middleware, which I'm sure you're very interested in what all of them do, and I will post these slides later. The slides I put in there really are descriptions of what each of the middleware does. And you can ask me after this talk. We can talk about it all you want to, or all we want to, but I figured we've had lunch. It is warm in here. We, nobody cares. So after all of those things, finally, finally we hit the router. This is where we hit, this is, this is where, this is where stuff gets real. Right? It's time. It's time. We're actually gonna send this request to the controller. Right? We hit the router right after the router is gonna hit the controller. Okay? This is it. This is it. We're excited, right? Everybody's excited. We went through all those slides to get here. Finally, we did. Remember, we have an application with one resource, resources post, and they did get user, and we went through the, all those slides that you saw previously. All those slides. You saw all those slides, and then, boom, 404, sorry. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> 
Okay. I have I actually I have music to go with this next slide, but I I'm not plugged in, so we're just gonna watch the slide. I, I made this slide. This slide took me forever and ever, and I was playing the music over and over and over again, and my wife is like, what the hell are you doing? Why? And I'm like, this is work. This is really work. So <laughs> what I want you to do is imagine that that stack, that stack that we went through, all those slides, imagine that we flipped that upside down and turned it into a mountain. Imagine that it's a mountain, right? And this, is, this is what it would look like, okay? This is our mountain. And, and what happens is we're climbing the mountain, we're going along here. Just imagine, like, you're climbing that mountain. We're doing really good. We got this request going. It's going through our system. We're so excited. It's going along, going along. Finally, finally, we reach the top. Almost get there. Oh, you get, the, the anticipation is killing me. We get to the router, and then, oh, sorry. <laughs> 404, not found. I'm, so I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry I put, you, I put you through all of this. Now, okay, this, clearly this, this has some problems. There are many problems. I mean, one of the problems is it's just too long. Why? why? There's too much stuff here. There's so much stuff going on. And honestly, it's just way too boring. What, like, really, who's going to dig through all those middleware to figure out, figure out what's going on? And, well, honestly, the main problem, though, is, like, I kept thinking about this, and I'm like, why is, why is the router actually buried so far? Do we really need to go through that entire stack just to figure out, oh, it's 404. <laughs> Can you imagine how frustrating that is? Like, I'm sitting there, I'm running a request through. I sit there, I look through all the middleware, and I'm like, we executed all of that stuff, all of it, just to return a 404. I'm sitting there like this, why, why? Come on. So one thing I would like to do in the future is maybe take the router and move that further up the stack so we can say, OK, let's return a 404 ASAP. So why, you know, why are there so many of these? Ah. It's here. <laughs> OK, hold on. Uh, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, now let me let me try it in let me try it in Catalan. L O L. <laughs> oh, I really don't like that one. I think I broke it. <laughs> I broke it. <laughs> if you don't do public speaking, you definitely should just just for doing stuff like this. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. So let's talk about Rack API limitations. And then after this, we're going to move into um, H2 and Rails and what our path moving forward is. So uh, obviously, we saw, we saw that huge stack of stuff. It's still. <laughs> so, middleware, the, one of the problems with, with Rack is that if you think about the middleware that we have today, there's only one type of middleware. There's only one middleware. We have a thing that calls stuff, but when you think about, or that just keeps calling down the stack, but when you think about the tasks, the different jobs that these middleware have, they're clearly different. For example, you have something that maybe you need to check out a database connection at the beginning of the request and then check it back in at the response, but you really don't care what happened in between. You don't care at all. It makes no difference to you, right? So, Oh, I'm, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk, about the, let's talk about the Rack API itself first. So this is our Rack API. This is it. We said it was some, oh, this, <laughs> LOL is gone. Uh, <laughs> so this is, the, this is the API itself. And the first problem that we have with this API is the end hash itself. So we can't really change the type of this hash or the type of this object. If you look at it, it there's a number of methods that are on a hash, and if I want to quack like a hash, it's nearly impossible. Now, the other problem is we can't change the keys. So what's really, really nice about objects is if you typo on a method name, you get an exception. That's really cool. If you typo on a hash key, <laughs> you get a nil, and you're like, well, 
did I do it right? Is it, was it supposed to be set? Was that supposed to be in the hash? Am I just missing it? Or did I typo? You have no idea what's going on. I actually, you know, I don't, we're programmers. I don't need to tell you why using objects is better than just using random hash keys. I don't think I need to tell you this. Uh, <laughs> So we have, we have stuff like this, too. The, um, you'll see here that our hashes, this hash-driven development, is coupled to these hash keys. Apps are coupled to these particular key names. Another annoying feature about this API is that ha hash access encourages allocations. You'll see we have those, string, those strings there that get allocated every time we execute this code. Like, for example, that string will get allocated. It actually gets allocated twice, once when the code is executed, and then another time when it's duped and when storing into the hash. Now, this type of stuff isn't going to happen when you're hidden behind an object. So the next thing we have to look at is the return value, which is the, this array. And again, we have some similar problems here. We can't change the type. I mean, it, we have all those methods that we have to quack to. It's coupled to the array layout, which means like, you know, what if someday I want to put that status code at the end of the array? Right? What if I just want to put it at the end of the array? I break everyone's applications. I can't change that, the layout of that array at all. It's coupled to that. The other problem is it makes streaming, this API makes streaming very, very difficult. We actually have to put essentially a promise in that last position in the array. It's not actually an array of strings. It would have to be a thing that quacks to each. So let's take another example. A, very, a more concrete example is adding a header. Like, let's say I wanted to add a header to the response. I'm going to write a middleware that adds a header to the response. So here's my middleware. It's going to add two headers. Basically, we've got one xcat gorby, another one that's x middleware belt. Because uh, <laughs> you. <laughs> All right, so we add the header, we add the header, and then return all that stuff. And what our, our object graph looks like this. So we have the web, the web server. The web server points has a reference to the middleware. Then the middleware has a reference to our application, and we call that. And the way that the data flows through the program looks like this. We have the client. It sends data to the web server, which sends it to the middleware. The application sends it back up. The middleware adds that new header, and then it gets sent on to the client. And what's interesting about this is you'll notice that that, that header didn't get added to the response until after the client had an opportunity to finish. Right? We had to hand off everything to the client before we could add that header to the response. Now imagine that our application now wants to stream data to the client. So let's say we add that in. We'll, we'll, let's look at the data flow if we do streaming responses. So the same thing happens. The client sends data down here, keeps sending down. Then the application directly sends data back to the client. It doesn't actually go back up the stack. The response clearly does go back up the stack, but we sent data to the client via some other means, not via the stack. So on the left-hand side, we have a stack. And on the right-hand side, we have I.O. So we're doing communication on the left with the stack and communication on the right with I.O. So our response is coupled to the stack, right? It's coupled, that middleware is coupled to that particular stack. And you could say that, you could even say that the response is coupled to the full stack, <laughs> conf. <laughs> I heard the groans. I could feel it. I could feel it. <laughs> I think I even saw someone just go like this. <laughs> All right. So the question is, what should we be doing? What should we be doing instead? Instead, I think what we should be doing is something like, well, something, I'm really sorry to say this, <laughs> something like Node.js is doing, where we're actually writing out a response. We should be writing out a response. We should be using objects with small APIs. We say we want to use small APIs so that we can actually replace those objects with something else. Like if you wanted to have a custom re request or a custom response, it's impossible to do today. I'd also like to add a context for allocating request and response objects so that we can have application servers that decide what type of request and response they have. Another thing that I would like to do eventually in Rack is essentially eliminate the concept of middleware, which I think is interesting. If you look at Node, if you look at Node today, you'll notice, I'm really sorry we're talking about JavaScript. <laughs> if, we're lo if you look at Node today, you go install Node, they, it has no concept of middleware. That does not exist. It's not a thing. 
you actually have to install something else like Connect in order to get middleware with your Node applications. And I think that's really cool. And I, I think it's cool because it actually it encourages uh, competition in the JavaScript space with regard to middleware. And I would like it if we had that same thing. Although I do have a suggestion for middleware, which would be three different types of middleware. I think looking through, going through every single middleware in the rack, uh, rack stack in Rails, I see these three different types. Event Essentially, we have event listeners, things that care about different types of events that occur in your system, like start request, end request. We actually have content filters, like, um, oh, gzip, things like that. And then we have content producers, so your application is actually producing content. I also want to take a look at my desired H2 API. Essentially, it would look something like this, where you just get a custom request object that has an HTTP2 question mark method on it. So if you, you say, hey, is this, an, is this an H2 request? If so, I want to push some data down. If not, I'll just do, do the normal thing. So I want to show a concrete example here, because this is, this is a technical talk. I'm giving technical information. I want to show a concrete example. And I don't really want you to read this stuff. I just want you to notice the, like, look at the, look at the shape of the code and look at how long it is. And note that it's not super hard. This is our, this is our basic example. And we can say, like, I, we, only, we only respond to, this is a basic H2 server. Uh, we only dispatch our request, or dispatch to the application if the headers have been finished streaming to us. Uh, and then we write a body out here. And uh, I want to zoom in on that one particular method, because I think it's important. Right here, we talked about earlier, H2 shares uh, I.O. objects, so there's only one, there's only one I.O. stream, which is kind of interesting when you think about the consequences that has on, say, multi-part posts, right? You think to yourself, well, I'm going to parse the multi-part post, so I'll just grab that I.O. object and read off of it until I parse all the stuff on there, but you can't do that with, with H2 because we're actually doing multiple requests and responses over the same socket. So the way that that's actually handled is there's IDs for each particular stream. And you'll see here, that's the stream ID. So for this one particular request and response, this is the ID for that particular stream. So here's our WebRick. I did a WebRick integration for this. And basically, I can look at the protocol and say, hey, is this H2? If not, I call super, and then WebRick does its normal thing. OK? And then we have a response here. That's my default one. Hi, mom. I always use that because I love my mom. So I just. <laughs> Every time I do that. So this is our, this is our response object integrating with WebRick. And again, I don't want you to read this particularly, but I want you to notice that it's actually uh, a subclass of WebRick's normal response object. Same thing here with the request object. It's a subclass of the normal request object. So from you as a client, it looks just like any other application. It looks exactly the same. The point I want to drive home here is that I think we can integrate this into our application servers and have it be completely transparent to you as an app developer. Uh, so anyway, after that, I served it up. And you can see this is our 404 not found page with H2 from WebRick, which I think is exciting. Um, and then we have, you can see the response there was four milliseconds. So that's like, I like that. That's very nice. Uh, protocol H2 with a real response that says, hi, mom, of course. So let's talk about Rails integration, and then I think we can finish up. Uh, so I want to add event handlers. If we add event handlers in the middleware, this is the justification I have for adding event, event handlers. Like, we have one middleware called rack lock. This one essentially takes out a mutex around your request and response. Uh, this is what it looks like before. And it doesn't, this locking mechanism doesn't really care about the actual response itself. So if we just use event handlers, this is what the code cleans up to. And it's much nicer, in my opinion. And in fact, it's more performant as well. The previous code had three allocations, eight method calls, and one conditional. And we actually reduced that to zero allocations, two method calls, and no conditionals, which I think is a nice improvement. So what I've been doing is, if you, if you go look at my commits through Rails, you'll see recently everything I've been doing is essentially converting end hashes into requests, request and response objects. So the legacy conversions that I've been doing in Rails, because Rails is a legacy code base, is essentially wrapping all end 
in hashes into a request object and then accessing methods on those. So our old code might look something like this where we're directly accessing that env hash. So in order to make the code forward compatible, what I'm doing is essentially turning that env hash or just calling methods on the request instead. So I just do that. Basically, we, I imp implement a method called session and have it do that, that call itself. And then in the new versions, we will just not have the hash. So the result is something like this. Yes, this is Rails on, on H2. Rails running H2. <laughs> OK, so I want, I want to finish this up with some, like, this is, this is our future here. It looks nice. Uh, I want to finish up with some H2 issues. Um, I like to call them HTT problem. Uh, <laughs> But these are, these are all over SSL, so it's HTTP problem. <laughs> so even in H2, the header values still suck. There's been nothing to improve the headers except for standardize on lowercase. So all the keys are lowercase. That's great. We're all very happy about that. But the values, for example, anybody who's had to parse cookies or parse any of those header values, it's exactly the same. We still have all of that annoying stuff there. Another thing, annoying thing is that browsers are dumb. So for example, like we were talking about pushing, pushing responses earlier. One question is, can, can you push assets twice? Hmm? Can you do that? And the answer is yes, you can. You can just push that asset down as many times as you want to. Uh, and the browser may or may not reject it, even if you push the same one over and over again. And if you think about it, pushing that same one, that, that actually sounds very inefficient. Ideally, you'd only want to push it once. Right? You only want to push that asset down once. Uh, one way I think we can get around this is we did talk about earlier how the browser maintains one connection open to the server. We have one connection open always. So since we have one browser con or one context for each browser, we can say, OK, in that context, we'll just keep track of the different assets that we've pushed. And if the application tries to push an asset that we've already pushed, we'll just say no. Now, we can't do this in production. The reason we can't do this in production is because maybe somebody's browser, well, maybe we could do it in production, but a browser could stay open for days and days and days, and they actually lose a connection with the server, and maybe we don't want to push again in that particular case. So there are edge cases there. So anyway, I was saying we don't want to do that. We may not be able to do this in production. One thing we can do, though, is we can say, well, if we're running behind Nginx or something which does support HTTP2, we can actually insert link headers in our response codes, and uh, Nginx will take care of that for us. It'll actually do the pushes for us. So we don't have to deal with it on the Rails side at all. We can just insert those headers, and Nginx decides what to do. So why do I want to do this? Why am I so interested in this? And I'll tell you why. Our application at work has tons and tons of assets in it. If you go look at that repo I pointed out earlier, I encourage you to go take a look at it. Um, we have tons of assets in our application, and when I load that app in development, it's not fun. I don't know if you have old apps like this with lots of assets, but you just sit there and you watch all the things go by, and you're like, yep, loading a page. <laughs> so <laughs> ideally, what I'd like to do is be able to take advantage of this in development. Especially what I want to do is I want to see stuff like this where we have the style sheet link tags in our ERB or Haml if you're using that, whatever you're using. We have this style sheet link tag and we can, inside of Rails, we can actually leverage that to say like, hey, I know that they're generating a style sheet link tag now. I know that this is a CSS they want to have pushed down to the client. I can automatically do that for you. We could also do that with JSON assets too. So if you want to push down push down JSON payloads with your Ember application. And there's other benefits. But my, my personal goal for doing this is that I want to have a very fast development environment. That is what I personally want. I'm a developer. I like fast development. So future work, things that I'm going to be working on in the future here coming up, uh, integrating push server, a push server with Rails, uh, getting all the tests to pass. <laughs> I sh I'm sorry, I should have written that in Catalan. <laughs> LOL, okay, LOL. Did, 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 did it show up? No, no, okay. Anyway, uh, another very important thing is backwards compatibility. So we need to make sure that we, have, we support the old 
uh, rack environment and patch middleware stuff. Uh, as Matt said during his keynote, we need to, like, compatibility is extremely important, and that's very true for me as well. I don't want to end up with Rails 5 being like Python 3. Can I say that? Is that mean to say? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't mean any offense, Pythoners. I love you all. All right, so conclusion, I will, I will conclude this with. Ruby's strength is OO. Really, it's an OO language, and we should use that strength to our advantage. So thank you very much.